from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, everybody. This is our first um, Poetry and Pizza, and we hope that it will be the first of many, both here at Andrews and all around the world. Um, mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. part of a program that's being put on by the Andrews Base Library, along with Library of Congress, their Poetry and Literature Center, and also FedLink. Um, we have people here from Library of Congress. We have Mr. Rob Casper and his assistant Caitlin are here. And Blaine Desi from FedLink couldn't make it, unfortunately. Um, as part of this program, we are also going to be having, uh, we are asking for um, contributions to a literary journal that we want to publish here on base. So if you have any writing or photography or artwork that you would like to submit to that, um, we have a handout that you can get at the end that will tell you all the rules for that. And then in the summertime, we're going to be having an arts festival, as probably along with our summer reading program, we'll be having a summer arts festival. So look forward to that. Um, you'll notice that it's being filmed. The Library of Congress is filming this program for us today. And it will be located on Library of Congress website under their um, Poetry and Literature Center. Um, Jehan Dubrow is our speaker today. She's our poet. She's here with her mother, Jeanette Dubrow. And at the end of the program, um, you'll be able to purchase copies of her book, Stateside, which is what she's reading from today. It's $17. So you can uh, talk to them about that. Also, how we're going to do our program today is Jean will speak from her, um, will read from her book. And then we will get our pizza, because we want our pizza along with our poetry. And we'll come back over here, and we'll continue with an informal question and answer time. And um, feel free to you know, ask her anything that you want. So at this time, I'd like to invite John to come up and read to us. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm really excited to be part of the inaugural Poetry and Pizza or Pizza and Poetry event. Um, thank you so much, of course, to the Library of Congress and to Andrews Air Force Base Library for hosting this event. Um, I think one of the reasons why I was asked to be the, the first poet to participate in this reading series is because um, I'm the author of three poetry collections. And my most recent book is called Stateside. Stateside is about my experiences as a military wife. My husband is career Navy, um, eight years in, which means 12, no, I take that back, 12 years in, which means eight more years to go. And a few years ago, it looked like he was going to be sent on what's called an individual augmentation, which is probably a term that many people in this room have heard of though most civilians are unfamiliar with the concept. And an individual augmentation is essentially a program in which um, often people from the Navy are sent to fill administrative positions, um, usually with the Army. And it looked like he was going to be sent either to Afghanistan or Iraq. And even though at that point, when we learned that this individual augmentation was possible, um, even though he'd been in the military for many years at that point, for some reason the idea of, of envisioning my husband um, on, on ground rather than on a ship really terrified me. And for the first time I started writing about what it meant to be married to the military and grappled with the fears. And even though, as is so often the case with military marriages, plans changed, and he didn't end up going on the individual augmentation. The door had been opened, and suddenly I was very scared um, and very aware of what it meant to be a military spouse. And so that's how the poems in Stateside began. So I'm going to read a little sec selection of poems from the book. Stateside is divided into three parts, the before, during, and after of a deployment. Um, and many of the poems were written while my husband was in the other room, not far away. Um, but the power of imagination, I think, is, is not to be underestimated. 
And one of the reasons why I'm a poet is because I have a very good and very scary imagination. And I could imagine a lot of terrible things happening to my husband and trying to imagine what that would mean for me. So the opening poem in the book um, takes its title for military terminology, as do a lot of the poems in the collection. It's called Secure for Sea. It means the movable stays tied. Lockers hold shut. The waves don't slide a metal box across the deck or scatter screws like jacks. The sea, a rebellious child that wrecks all tools which aren't fastened tightly or fixed. At home, we say secure when what we mean is letting go of him. And even if we're sure he's coming back, it's hard to know. The farther out a vessel drifts, will contents stay in place or shift? This next poem is set in Maryland, Assateague Island, March. We toss our coffee on the sand, watching the liquid sink and fade to almost nothing, like disappearing ink. The wind disturbs our tent flap, jostles the poles, sways the frame so that I hope we cannot stay the night. Why don't we leave, I ask. He shakes his head, and in my borrowed sleeping bag I lie awake, shiver beneath its summer weight, curl myself into a question mark. I listen for hours to the pace of waves, an irritant like sand inside a shoe. He always shuts his eyes before I do. He slumped in front of the TV or pinned by an open book across his chest. And here, surrounded by the racket nature makes, he rests so deep asleep I don't exist. At 8 a.m. we stand, roll up our beds. I couldn't sleep at all, he says. Too cold, though you seem fine. I laugh to think of all those hours I listened for his breath and he for mine. The air, a frozen wing, the wild ponies snuffling for food. God damn our domesticity. At least we should have sighed the other's name or rubbed together, tried burning like two broken sticks. So this next poem, you're going to hear some repetition of sounds, repetition of phrases. Um, this poem is based on a traditional French form called the triolet, in which lines are repeated over and over again to create new meanings as the repetitions occur. And the title is O Dark Hundred, which, as I'm sure many of you know, means very late at night or very early in the morning. O Dark Hundred. This is the hour that writers eulogize. Midnights when my husband guards his post against monotony. Before sunrise, this is the hour that writers eulogize. In port, a sentry walks the deck, replies all conditions normal, surveys the coast. This is the hour that writers eulogize. Midnights when my husband guards his post. I can imagine that he faces west, the sky like a purple sail above the sea. Somewhere, a buoy creaks, waves sink or crest, and I imagine him. He faces west to stand and watch and wait alone, the rest of the crew asleep in the machinery. I can imagine him. He's facing west, the sky a purple sail above the sea. My words are just reflections from the shore and the page imperfect mirror of his ship where white lights blink above each metal door. My words are just reflections. On the shore, there's radio silence, no talk of war, only the sound of nothing, only the, wor the blip of words reflecting distantly from shore and the page in perfect mirror of his ship. I never know um, whether to read this poem or not, but I think I will. Um, the title takes, um, its, it takes its, it has its origins in military phonetic alphabet. So we know that, for instance, in the military, um, A is alpha, B is bravo. So the title of this poem is Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. <laughs> Foxtrot the Navy, I yell into the phone, the first time that my husband groans deployed, a word we've waited for since war began four years ago. Let whiskey slide as slow as bullets down my throat. Let foxtrot be both verb and noun. 
Foxtrot the Navy, I say again, but softer than before, as if the whisper of a dance could keep him here. I need a shot of whiskey just to take the news, a song in two-four time and rhinestone shoes. Foxtrot, I sigh, third time's the charm in everything but war, oh ugly, big sublime. I'm buzzing with white noise. Call in the dancing girls, the boys who swallow slugs from jerry cans, moonshine sloshed to the brim of each canteen. Let whiskey taste toxic as benzene. And every military spouse I've ever spoken to has told me that no matter how much you exp expect deployments, you're always angry when, they're, when they arrive. And I think that's just human nature. So this is a sonnet against war movies. I see my husband shooting in platoon, and there he is again in MASH. How weird to hear him talk like Hawkeye Pierce. And soon I spot him everywhere, his body smeared with mud, his face bloodied. He's now the star of every ship blockade and battle scene, the fighting 69th, a bridge too far, Three Kings, Das Boot, and Stalag 17. In Stalingrad, he's killed, and then he's killed in Midway and a few good men. He's burned or gassed. He's shot between the eyes or shoots himself when he comes home again. Each movie is a training exercise, a scenario for how my husband dies. I think one of the powers of the sonnet is that it allows you to say, terrible, difficult things within the safety of those tiny 14 lines. They protect you because you know there's a limit to the shape of the poem. The last poem in this opening section is um, inspired by one of my favorite war poems. It's called Reading Stephen Crane's War is Kind to My Husband. I packed your sea bag today, six pairs of pants, shirts folded in their rigid squares, your socks balled up like tan grenades. I put my photo in as well, laid it there between the Kevlar vest and heap of clothes. Don't weep, the poet warns. Don't weep. On 60 Minutes, a soldier turns his face toward us, shows the camera his burns, small metal slivers still embedded in the skin, his mouth a scrap of ragged tin. The young man's face was beautiful before, smooth, unblemished as my own. For war is kind, I read. Great is the battle god, and great the auguries, the firing squad, the sickly green of night vision that cuts the darkness open at its seams, gutted and spilling on the sand. Great is the Glock, the Aegis combat system, the Blackhawk circling. Great are the K-Bar fighting knives, the shells that sing through air as though alive. The middle section of the collection moves into the deployment. And as a way of tackling the problem of deployments, I decided to look at the, the figure of the military wife in literature. And what I discovered is that there aren't very many examples of mi military wives in classical literature. In fact, the only one who I could really discover is Penelope from the Odyssey which, as I like to say, is kind of an old book. So it seemed like it was time to update the tradition and to address the fact that military wives, military spouses, have not been represented in literature and what that silence means for the telling of this story. This is Ithaca. There's war beyond the shores, but here there's Dairy Queen and Taco Bell, the Westfield shopping mall, the cell phone superstore, Home Depot, Sears. And home remains a metaphor for something else, a wife who tries to guard her chastity, ties it like a yellow ribbon to her door, sticks it to the bumper of her car so that her neighbors know she sleeps alone, almost a widow to the Trojan War, her love preserved in plastic wrap like some dessert too beautiful to taste. At PTA meetings, she's chased by divorcees and other glum suitors. Nobody seems to care that she still wears a wedding ring. Odysseus is gone, same thing as being dead. And so men stare at her when she buys groceries 
or takes the dog out for a pee. She's Ithaca, trapped in her own body, an island circled by the seas. So in other words, what I wanted to do is, is try to, to bring Penelope into the 21st century and, and see what, what a real woman would do with that kind of um, distance and loneliness. This is Penelope considers a new do. The magazines declare, don't ever cut your hair just after breaking up. So what if he's been absent nearly 20 years? Fact is, each day the loss feels new the shears still biting as the first time they'd been honed. Looks like he's never coming back. You've moaned for two decades about the shroud of bangs which veils your face, the way your ponytail hangs down your back like a ragged piece of rope. Your follicles have given up all hope of hair that moves, a fair faucet's flip, Meg Ryan's shag, or anything so hip as the pixie, the asymmetric bob. Go see the stylist to the stars and sob your story out. That endless Trojan War, those gods. Andre has heard it all before. He'll trim away dead ends so razor fast. Chop, chop, snip, snip. You'll wonder why the past cannot be sliced so easily away or dyed a golden shade to hide the gray. And the last section of the collection moves into the return, what happens after the deployment. And to me, this is the most interesting part of the problem. What happens when the physical distance is erased, but the emotional distance remains? I think most people who haven't been through deployments imagine that once the, the absent one returns, that everything is perfect and as it was before. And in my experience, that's never the case. This is enophilia, which means love of wine. Those months away from you, I teach myself to cook with wine, admiring the change a Beaujolais enjoys inside the pot, its sly divestment of alcohol, slowly from the heat, like a girl unbuttoning her blouse. I'm indiscriminate. All reds will do because you've never had a taste for white. The frigid Chardonnay or Pinot Gris so chilled it makes the crystal goblet sweat. You're loyal to the glass of claret light. I'm talking warmth and things that need to breathe before they're sipped. I mean the old varietals, picked and stomped on, a purpled bruise delicious for its pain, the grape skin's shredded gauze. And so I plan a week of meals that are a lesson in desiring like Tristan und Isolde, where consummation never comes, and booze is an excuse for letting loose again. Again, the bottle spilling liquid from its open mouth, the green neck sticky there, our tongues discovering the metal tannins, and something close to blood, but sweeter. Situational awareness. These past few weeks, I'm more than just aware of where he is. I'm hypersensitive, stretched thin as a length of wire, a hair trigger mechanism. Nothing can live near me. I twitch each time the telephone rings through the dark, so like a warning bell, I want to run from it, escape the green zone of this house. Who said that war is hell? Well, waiting can be worse. Show me a guy shipped overseas, and I'll show you a wife who sees disaster dropping from the sky. The ambush always comes. Her husband's life, a road of booby traps and blind spots made to hide the rock, the shell, the thrown grenade. That's another sonnet. Again, I, I believe that the sonnet can contain these things that we would never normally say in polite society. And this is the title poem of the book, Stateside. Stateside. If there is such a thing as elasticity, then we are stretched nearly to the breaking. The weight becomes my pulse. Come home, come home. Day eight, day nine, day 10, day 63. When he comes home, our miles increase. The band pull taut between our separate points and we're released, made slack again. We almost don't belong inside the same time zone, much less this house. 
He's spouse instead of lover, stateside instead of overseas. I feel myself withdrawing from his hand, a touch I want but barely understand. My husband, um, in his service in the Navy, is what's called a surface warfare officer. Um, and again, I find the military language to be filled with the potential for poetry. So this poem is called Surface Warfare. Our arguments move across the surfaces of things, smooth, flat areas where silence floats for weeks. The rule, whoever speaks first loses. If he patrols the living room, then I control our bed, an Atlantic filled with my insomnia, the quilts too thick to wade through. Some nights I think drowning would be easier and drink mouthfuls of salt. No shallows here, only the fathoms of marriage, and we are anchored side by side, the darkness wide, percussive as a mine. I'll just read, how am I doing for time? I'll just read three more poems. Um, this is one of the uh, fewer funny poems in the book, and it's based on my one experience of living in military housing up in Newport, Rhode Island, Navy housing. On Jones Street, every house is painted white. Each door is white, and every yard adheres to certain rules. The grass at crew cut height, an apple blossom tree tilted toward the sun, a single bush trimmed squat and round and so symmetrically it seems man-made. No one can deviate from others in the row. How easily I lose myself out here. Even the dog can barely sniff his way back from the park. Was it a left we took? A right? Perhaps it's safer just to stay indoors than go off course again. Oh look, another flag, another garden gnome. Another sign proclaiming, home, sweet home. OK, so maybe it's not so much funny as bitter. <laughs> <laughs> and this poem is a poem I, I, it was the first piece I wrote when I moved to my current home on the eastern shore of Maryland. And it's inspired by a very great poem by the American poet Robert Haas called Meditation at Lagunitas, Eastern Shore. Talking about distance is a way to close the space. Consider the bridge that curves above the Chesapeake, which when we mention it, becomes a child's toy. Or that the Beltway is not a contest of families wrapped in steel, speeding toward collision, demanding it, but just a road that circles on itself. Remember when we touched at 22, so willingly aligned in one twin bed, your spine pressed up against the wall and mine about to break over the edge. These days, we're greedy in our king, spread wide although we barely scrape together in our sleep. We're isolates with only water in between. Closeness used to say, closing your arms around me like a measurement of rope. We fell asleep to Billie Holiday, a long, sad looping of her voice that warned, not everyone is lucky in this world. And I remember when you dressed for work, how I hated watching as you tied each shoe, the tight finality of laces cinched in bows. It's been a while since I said the buttons on your shirt reminded me of afternoons and evenings spent in bed, hours now indistinct as the facing shore, our backs like metal arches, our words moving from mouth to caverned mouth and mouth again, the river of our bodies murmuring. And I'm going to end with the last poem in the collection, um, which appropriately enough is a prayer. And it begins with a line from the great World War I poet um, Siegfried Sassoon, Shabbat prayer on the occasion of war. A flare went up, the shining whiteness spread, as though it were a match bright enough to light the room, but not so bright it snuffed the residue of darkness overhead. There once was darkness signifying calm, our candles glowed beside the window. The nights did not explode, or bullets ricochet, or firebombs turn streets to ash. We drank a glass of wine. The night served as the compliment today, like salt on something sweet. And in this way, 
we tasted syrup mixed with brine. And in this way, we learned a prayer that joined the shadow with the shining flare. Thank you. So I think we'll get started again. Uh, I'm Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center at the Library of Congress and one of the uh, co-sponsors for this afternoon's event. Um, so we're just going to open up, open up for questions. Because we're recording this and the mic for the recording is up here, what we'll do is you can ask a question and then I'll just repeat it for the microphone and then John can answer it. And I have a few questions too if you guys, if you guys feel shy. But I figure we'll give you, give you first crack at um, asking her any questions you may have. Does anybody have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the question of how many books. <laughs> um, I, I have three full-length collections, uh, The Hardship Post from the Fever World and Stateside. And then I also have what's called a chapbook, which is like a mini collection um, called The Promised Bride. And my fourth book is coming out uh, in fall 2012 from Northwestern University Press. It's called Red Army Red. Is that book also focused on military? It, it isn't. Um, I'm the child of American diplomats, and I spent most of my, my childhood growing up overseas, in, especially in the Eastern Bloc. So Red Army Red is about the intersection of um, communism and my adolescence. And it basically uses the oppressive language of um, communism to speak about the oppressiveness of the adolescent body. That sounds like some fun. <laughs> <laughs> but this was the first book, though, that you devoted exclusively to talking about um, yeah. your experience uh, as a military wife. How did that? How did that shift happen? You said that you, you, you your husband almost got uh, uh, got what was the term? The individual, individual augmentation. augmentation. But I'm sure you were tempted in the past to uh, throw some uh, great military language into your poetry. It had never occurred to me. It was really it was really the fear um, and the fact that the poems could help me to navigate what I was feeling and. Um, figure out what all of this meant and poems are really safe space as I alluded to when talking about sonnets and um, within the constraints of a poem especially if you're working within a traditional form um, you can feel productive to say much more difficult things yeah it's interesting that you said that though because a lot of people think that poems are pretty scary things to have to write. Yeah. I, I, do you find that, that the more formal a poem is, the more you have a certain structure you can work with, the more you feel like it allows you the room to say whatever you want? Not necessarily whatever I want, but it, it does allow me to say things that I might not say if we were sitting at the dinner table um, and I was feeling in a confessional mood. Right, right. Oh, yeah. I I saw a hand over there. Yeah, yeah. I'm childless. Um, my only child is a soft-coated Wheaton Terrier named Argos. <laughs> Did you have stories about him? There, I think I, in stateside, I have reached the, the acceptable limit of how many times the poet is allowed to write about her dog. <laughs> <laughs> and in the middle section of the book, there is a, a, parent, a parenting poem. And one of the reasons why I wrote the middle section in the, of the book in the voice of Penelope was so that I could write about some of my experiences, but also I, I didn't just want the book to be about me and and what it's like for me to be a military spouse. So writing in the voice of this modern Penelope allowed me to write um, about being a mother. So for instance, there's a there's a poem in the book called um, At the Mall with Telemachus. And Telemachus is, is the child of Penelope and Odysseus. And basically Telemachus has a meltdown in the shopping mall. Um, because I've been told by many military wives that the first thing that happens um, on a deployment is that the children immediately start to exhibit what everyone else is feeling really internally in a very public way usually. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like that's what poems allow you to do is to, is to throw something that's more imaginary in there with along with a kind of description of something that you feel that you can talk about in other ways like you know writing in a letter or writing in a story or reading in an article. I mean I'm very aware of when I'm reading one of my own poems which bits um, are not purely accurate in terms of my biography but which hopefully feel accurate in terms of truth-telling um, and I also write a lot of um, persona poems. So my second book um, is written entirely in the voice of an imaginary Yiddish poet um, who I invented. 
Um, because, I mean, one of the things about poetry is it has its roots in theater. And um, theater isn't purely autobiographical. It's, it's about performance and about play acting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got to read some of your book, um, Taking the Wild that you're talking about. It seemed like, and I could be remembering wrong, but it seemed like that that was more in theater. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if you find that you're going to form because of the content of this, um, of this book that you mean that um, more so than in that book, also kind of talks about some sort of disturbing things. Yeah. yeah. So do you mean that here because of the content? So the question is about sort of the move from uh, the free, a free verse type of writing to more formal um, formal writing, yeah. That's such a great question. I, I really think um, that content dictates form, although by the time you get to the final poem, the relationship between form and content should be inextricable. Um, with those um, fragments um, in From the Fever World, uh, basically the way I wrote those was I initially wrote them as sonnets and then started imagining, well, what would happen if these poems were buried in the ground for 50 years, um, and then they were pulled up, and then they were translated into English? What, what would these perforated poems look like? And so that's how they became free verse. But they actually started quite formally, because that's what my background is in. Right now, I'm working on a book of prose poems. But many of those prose poems, when I write a draft of the prose poem, I then break it into lines and then return it to the prose poem form and then break it into lines again. And um, so it, I think when, you, when your training is in formal verse, even when the final product looks, looks very free, you know, those restrictions are still there. And of course, any poet who works only in free verse will tell you that free verse isn't free. So there's always re restriction. I wondered, though, a lot of your, a lot of the poems you read today contained not only uh, military terminology, but talked about domestic life, talked about ordinary things. But of course, they were, they were highly formal. They yeah. were, they were very rhythmic. Yeah. There was a lot of rhyme in there. And can you talk about? Because I think pe when people think about poems, they think about it in you know elevated language, rhyming, um, sort of yeah. arcane or really, really, really kind of removed from everyday life. And yet those poems showed the kind of balance between uh, everyday language language that you are using uh, in your work, and also this sort of beautiful, rhythmic kind of quality of poems. I definitely think that in talking about something as regulated um, as military life, it makes sense to, to write formally. Um, my particular ear is such that when I work in formal verse, I still prefer, in general, pretty low, dic low diction, a lot of plain speech, with an occasional polysyllabic word thrown in for spice. And that's just my particular taste. I mean, there are many, as you know, there are many formal poets working today who, who write in a much higher register. Um, and that's what is appealing to their ear. But I find the longer I work in form, the more interested I am in seeing how invisible it can, be can become, especially in terms of the levels of language. Yeah. Any other questions out there? Uh, yep. Yeah. I don't want to hard this, no, 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 please, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, so it was, it was interesting to me that the titles for many of your poems um, using military language, yeah. um, which I was wondering if that was something that you were aware at all, maybe not as you were writing, but as you were collecting your work about your audience. And if you thought that that would be a military audience, or if the poems were some way of like translating so really the question is about using that military language and, and thinking about what, what, what audience that, that caters to or different audiences. Um, those are, this, you're asking really good questions. When I started writing the book, initially I was thinking I would be speaking to a military audience and in some ways for a military audience. My feeling about poetry is that even though many people are terrified by poetry and think it's really scary, and many people hate poems too, right? Um, even those people have some kind of respect for poetry. They, they recognize that poems treat serious subjects seriously. And one of the things that bothered me when I started doing my research and discovering that the military wife really wasn't represented in literature was that I'm very aware that because we, we expect poems to treat serious subjects seriously, when a subject simply isn't addressed in poetry, that must mean that it's not worthy of being discussed. 
And so initially when I started writing stateside, I had a feminist mission in mind to talk for and about a group of people who are um, often forced or asked to remain silent. As we know, in the military community, you have to, you know, maintain a stiff upper lip. Um, sometimes talking about how difficult it is to be part of a military community is considered unpatriotic. And so these were some of the concerns I had and some of the reasons um, that, that I brought to the writing. And um, I think that what's happened now is that when I read the poems to a military audience, they all sort of, they get the jokes, right? I don't have to explain what Whiskey Tango Foxtrot means to this room. But if I go to another audience, then I have to spell out exactly what it means so that they can even understand then some of the jokes that are embedded in the poem. And so the, the collection works in a number of different ways depending on the audience. But for me, the most important thing is that I think it's time for military spouses to be heard, not only in a kind of profane way, like in the blogosphere, um, but also in, in high art. Um, because that's one of the things that allows people to say, again, even if they're terrified of poetry, they'll say, well, if poems talk about this, this must be important. Did you feel like there were places you couldn't go, even in the poems, things you couldn't address, talk about in terms of either the relationship between you and your husband or the sort of larger issues of being a military wife? The book is very apolitical, even though I have very particular political leanings. Um, but that wasn't something I wanted to talk about in the book, because I wanted the book to really be a book about marriage. Um, and so I've had people ask me, well, why didn't you talk in the book about your opinions about the war in Iraq? And that just wasn't what I wanted the book to do, even though I have very strong opinions about um, our military choices. So yeah. that was what I left out. Yeah. Looks like this one. So the question about how, how you end up writing and whether or not it's something that happens quickly and from beginning to end or you spend a lot of time revising? I write every day. Um, I sort of model my writing life on the poet William Stafford who when he died had published thousands of poems and there were thousands of unpublished poems because he got up every morning and treated poem writing like a job. Um, and so I write every day. Um, I don't believe, I think because I write every day in this thing called inspiration. Um, instead, what I believe is that, like an athlete who goes and works out, and some days the workout is really difficult, and some days the workout is really easy, on those days when the workout is really easy, that's because you've gone to work out every day. And I think the same thing is true for poem writing. On those days where the poem feels like it just arrives in me, that's because there are all those other days when I just sat in front of my laptop and faced the blank screen and typed and typed and typed and typed. And those days were mis miserable and the poems I wrote were miserable. But the compensation is if I put in that time every day, then there are some times where the poems just arrive so easily that they, f they feel like inspiration. Do you think, do you think um, being a poet is like doing any other kind of work? I mean, it's interesting that you use the, the athlete metaphor and you know, I mean, you're talking about work obviously in this book, but do you think it's just like, I mean, obviously, you're, you also have a job yeah. besides writing poems. Yeah. I think I think it. Sh I treat it like work, but that that doesn't mean that I think that's a bad thing. I think work is good. Um, so, to me, my duty is to to put in the hours every day with with poems, and um, that when I don't do that, when life gets in the way, and for whatever reason I find that my schedule is off. I, I feel it negatively later on. Um, when I come back to the page then, um, it's much harder, and I regret having let life interfere with my, my schedule. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I was just wondering, what was the first time when you, when you wrote, and after that, when was the, the time when you realized that that's something very important? Just about the, the, your history of writing. I wrote my first poem when I was 11. 
It was about seagulls. Um, I don't know why I wrote it. I don't know anything about seagulls, uh, um, but I was somehow moved by them. And I wrote this thing, and I remember thinking, wow, that felt really good to do that. And then in high school, I wrote poems and sort of thought, oh, maybe I'd like to write one day. It was only after college, um, I was going through a terrible breakup with the man who eventually became my husband. Um, <laughs> and I was filled with rage. And I started writing every day. And I was writing, um, every day I wrote a sonnet in the voice of a mythological character. They were really bad. I remember there was one about, um, <laughs> about um, Daphne who turns into a laurel tree. And I remember the final couplet of the poem was, um, I do not think that sex is immoral. I simply prefer to be a laurel. <laughs> 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 but writing those really bad sonnets every day was great practice. It was like calisthenics. Because I think I did that for a year. And by the end of the year, I had 365 sonnets, most of which were terrible, but boy could I hear um, the rhythm of iambic pentameter, and boy did I understand the way a sonnet moves in terms of constructing an argument. Uh, and so that was, that was, it was during those sonnets that I realized I want to be a poet, and I remember saying to my parents, I'm going to go get this thing called an MFA in creative writing. And they said, much to their credit, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> and so that's, that's how it happened. Do you think that, that um, people, when they write creatively, when they write poems or stories, that they should focus on writing what they know, or they should focus on letting their imagination take them in whatever direction they can go? I think it really depends on the writer. I mean, for me, what, what interests me in the process is making kind of a blurry and uncomfortable line between um, imagination and, and autobiography or biography. For instance, right now I'm writing a book um, about the ch my mother's childhood. Um, but the poems are, are, are my version of my mother's childhood. If, if you talk to my mother sitting over in row two, <laughs> she would say, eh, you know, that, that there's, there's a lot of invention happening. So I'm really interested in the intersection between fiction and um, biography, but I think every poet would give you a different answer. Yeah. 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 Do you ever fear that, since you are a Navy spouse, that your poems won't translate to the other branches? Oh, that's an interesting question. That so the the question of of, of um, the the branches and how how they sound to other people in the military. I mean, I'm aware that it's probably an issue, but it doesn't it doesn't worry me, because. Um, I mean, my, for instance, my husband laughed when, when I told him I was coming to Andrews Air Force Base because you know about the tensions between Navy and Air Force. So he thought it was, he thought it was amusing. But at the same time, even if there is different language being used or different experiences, for instance, of deployments, um, I think most military spouses will tell you it's terribly lonely and difficult um, to be apart from your loved one and that the reentry period is often extremely painful. And so I think that's really the only issue of translation that I'm worried about. Yeah. I mean, it was interesting that you brought up that the reason you thought about this book was because you imagined your husband on land and somehow he, he seemed safer yeah. out at sea that if he was going to be on land that that was a whole different ball game. Which was a delusion. I mean, <laughs> I know that a ship's environment is like being in a construction site. And especially my husband is an engineer. Um, he's around flammable, explosive liquids all day. Um, you know, when they talk about something breaking on a ship, they use the word casualty. And I think that um, there's, there's no accident that they talk about the machinery as broken people um, because a broken piece of equipment can mean a broken person in a very sh short period of time. So I was deluding myself, but that was what was helpful about the possibility of the individual augmentation was it forced me to face the fact that I was creating this nice little cocoon of safety around our life, imagining that I was somehow protected and, and untouched because I had a PhD and I was going to be teaching creative writing at a small liberal arts college. These were the kinds of fantasies that I created for myself to imagine that somehow that meant that my life would be untouched by danger. Did that affect your writing 
like not as in your inspiration, but as far as being able to write, did you go through a lull, or did it not really affect you as far as being able to produce? So the question is just how that individual augmentation affected your ability to, to sit down and spend that time every day writing poems that you talk about. I think because I don't believe in inspiration, I also don't believe in writer's block. So I've never had the experience of not being able to sit down and write something. Um, and I think the only difficulty when you're um, feeling more emotional and you're trying to write is that you have to remind yourself that part of what often works best in a poem is a little emotional detachment. And that's why form was so important in writing these poems was because thinking about, well, how am I going to how am I going to work with this villanelle structure? Um, that's a distraction from, f from freaking out emotionally. So the poems are actually a great coping mechanism because they're intellectual challenges. Any other questions? You got one more? Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting question. So the question is, uh, art, do you mean art as in something? Right. How do you think audiences relate to, relate to what poems can do or how they should feel about you know, experiencing poems? I think there's a poet out there for everyone, even, even people who think they hate poetry. So I might not be the, the poet. For, for every person who says, I hate poetry. But I might be that poet for one or two people who would say, oh, I didn't know that poetry could sound like that or that poetry could talk about those things. Um, I think that we, because um, especially here in the United States, poetry isn't taught particularly well from, from when students first start encountering poetry in elementary school, that by the time I see students in, in college, they don't know what they think poems are, but they are pretty sure they hate them. And that poems have nothing to do with them. They don't sound like them. They don't talk about things that the students care about. And so part of my job is to persuade them that perhaps their ideas about poetry were mistaken to begin with. For instance, a lot of um, young male students in the classroom will think that poems are just about emotion. And at least my experience of writing poems is that it's an extremely cerebral, mathematical process. Um, and so I can at least talk to them about what my experience of writing poems is and say, that's interesting. Why do you think that poems are just about emotion? So just getting students to talk about um, what they imagine poems to be, their preconceptions about poetry, can begin to unearth some of the misconceptions that people have. Well, I think that's a, oh, you one more question, one more question. Your choice of language in the poem seemed very modern, and your style as well. Did you do that on purpose to try and reach an audience that was kind of poetry illiterate, or was that just more of your writing style? So it's just, the, yeah, how, how you try to reach your audience through a contemporary modern style. I think it's, that's both, and that's a great question. I wanted, I was imagining, oh, if I was reading to a, if I were reading to a room of military spouses, um, what would be important for me to for them to understand it in this poem. And I thought that lowering the, the diction would, would help. But also, as I said before, the more I work in formal poetry, the more interested I am in plain speech, um, in part because I want to disguise all of the, the apparatus that are making the, the poem move. Um, so when I work in meter, I don't even want you to notice that I'm working in meter. Although you might later on say, well, that was really nice. That, that phrase was really nice to say. It felt really good in my mouth. Um, but I don't want to call too much attention to, to some of the techniques that I'm, I'm using because that's just not where my tastes in poetry lie. Well, I think we've, we've used up our, our hour. I was, you are a great audience. I'm so happy you came out. Um, so happy to have John Dubrow here for our, our inaugural series. And I should say again that if you have poems or stories or photographs you would like to submit to the new uh, Andrews Air Force Base Journal. There are there are uh, handouts you can you can you can get and uh, over uh, next to where the pizza once was uh, before you ate it. Uh, there are hopefully a few more copies of Stateside for you to uh, pick up. So uh, there are copies here. I'm sorry. So 
Thanks again for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. And hope to see you at the next Pizza and Poetry. We're not going anywhere. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being such a wonderful audience. I'm sorry. <laughs> Try that again. Oh, should I say something again? Like what I'm saying right now? <laughs> and continue question, saying. You can answer. Does your husband feel like he's, he's the, the inspiration for all of your pain in your life so that you can... I, th I think so, and I think sometimes that's good, and sometimes it's bad. <laughs> Um, is he, as he said, some things are outlawed you can't write about? He hasn't, but there's an, there's an unspoken understanding yeah. of what that would Don't be. Don't answer it, just look at it. <laughs> 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 this is like, slightly embarrassing. Just ask her a long question. I'm going to ask you a really long question that really isn't a question at all. I'm just going to talk for a long, long time until Jim says that it's okay and I can stop talking, which is That's hopefully true. very soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.